really know him. That's my answer on are you for Judge Kavanaugh or not. And, and I don't have any power over the presidency, I don't have any office of the president, I don't have any power over the legislative. I don't have any power over anything that's going on in Washington, D.C. Do you? Now, I can pray. Amen to that. We can pray. And we can be aware, and we can learn, and we can study, and 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 uh, do the watchman on the wall calling. We we want to walk in fulfillment of being good watchmen on the wall. Amen. But I don't really know them. But yet, on the other hand, still, people are saying, "Well, <laughs> the women's lip movement. Women don't lie." And the I just want to. Uh, Use a biblical example. How many of you remember Potiphar's wife and what happened there with Joseph and the fact that she lied and accused him of rape? Women don't lie. The Bible says all men are liars, folks. And that, by the way, includes women too. So, uh, I don't know, though. You know, right now, uh, because of the way that Democrats and the progressives act and behave and all that junk that's going on. Uh, I, and I, I do want as strong of a conservative as we can possibly get to be on the Supreme Court. And I'm fearful for our nation. I'm fearful for the direction that it's going. And um, I pray in faith, I'm trusting God direct. If Kavanaugh is a good man, I have no real reason to believe that he wasn't, uh, that he isn't in many ways. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But uh, I pray that God will, if that's his will and he'll be good for America, that he'll allow him on uh, to the, uh, be elected and appointed as a Supreme Court justice. Because like it or not, we're involved in this, in, in this world. We're involved in our nation and its government and to whatever degree that we can, we want to pray that right decisions are made and, and God will appoint and let godly people be in uh, office. All right, this will be, I think, part seven of our uh, series on the prodigal uh, children. It, we're on train up your children or child, but we're really, we're really getting into the uh, children of Israel aspect. And, of course, the prodigal son story. The prodigal son, as I said last week, and I think I said it in the prior week also, is a parable. It's not about calling the world, by the way, to repentance. Okay? Are you listening? It's not about the prodigal son. It is not about calling the world to repentance. Well, why might you bring that up, Pastor? Well, the people called in the Bible, who are they? Who are the people called and chosen of God in the Bible? And that's where we want to stay. That's where we want to be. That's where our faith has to, has, must be derived from in many ways. It's that word. The word comes unto us and gives us truth and light and understanding. It, it, it gives us guidance on how we should conduct our life, what kind of friends we should have, what type of an environment we should stay, should uh, walk in, how we should uh, raise up our children. Amen? It has lots of good stuff for us in the Word of God. And according to the Word, or I've been wasting my time over the many years, it's a calling unto who? It's a calling unto the Abrahamic, or we could say Hebraic, Caucasian, let's say, tribes of Israel, the people of Israel. That they need to do what? That they need to repent. Amen? That Israel, the Jacob Israel people, need to repent. If I were to go to China as an example or Korea, India, Mongolia, Taiwan, the Philippines, Congo, Zimbabwe, uh, the lands of black Africa. And 
If I were to ask these indigenous people to repent, how do you think they would respond to me? If I went over there to most places, most of those lands, and went to those people, those pre adamite people, and asked them to repent, for the most part, they would do what? They would laugh at me. Amen? No. <laughs> I'm generalizing to a certain extent there, but that's what they would do to me. And why? Their response would be, repent of what? White man? White man? Why? What, what am I, must I repent of? <laughs> Don't you think that's a pertinent question? Repent of what? They would say, we're not under divine covenant. We were never given the law. We have no relationship with your God. We have no biblical mandate. The, bro the, the blood of Christ that you tell us about, it really has no meaning to us. That's the kind of responses it re really that I would get if I went to these lands and these people. Now, if I went to these lands and these people and said, you know, Christ died upon the cross for you. Christ died to redeem you. And, and Christ died for all people, all races, all the different DNA that exists in the world today. He died for them. How might, they, how might they respond? You see, that would be basically telling them also that this is a spiritual thing, and Christ died for you, and you become spiritual Israelites in a sense by accepting Christ as your Savior. Then we can get them to identify, identify with the gospel and call themselves a Christian. Is that what a Christian is? You see, if we destroy meaning, if we twist biblical meaning and biblical, and we misapply what the Word of God is saying, what kind of results are we going to get? That's what's happening today. It's not a real, true biblical gospel. It's a gospel of some other kind, though. It's another form of some other gospel, but it's not the Bible gospel. It's not the Bible word. The idea of biblical repentance, therefore, would have no real meaning or purpose for the people in those lands. Christ didn't go to them. That's not being mean. I'm just talking facts here. I'm not trying to put anybody down or belittle anybody. I'm trying to get to biblical facts and biblical understanding. You see, if we're in a court, and this is in a sense in church, we're in a court. It's a law of God's law. We're presenting God's word, and we want God's truth to come forth and be presented to you, the jury, God's people, God's covenant people. But now that's, that's not how it is today. Especially said to say in the juries that are coming forth today and are being called forth. They're not real biblical juries. The light's going to go on one day about kind after kind on all the principles that are involved with the kind after kind. But we're going to have to get down to what does that really mean? I mean, uh, again, we want to be in proper alignment with the Bible word, with what Bible declares for his people. And who are his people again? Israel. God only came to make a covenant with Abraham Isaac, and Jacob. 
And that's whom he has called. And that's whom his word is to in the scriptures. Babylon has come along today and they have twisted and confused all of this. And they have mingled the truth. Just like people are mingling today. Why are they mingling today? Because someone, a group, a religion, whatever various groups are out there, politics, media, whatever, they told them it's okay. There's, they've given them a seal of approval to do all these various Babylonian things and Babylonian actions and behavior. Why are you doing what you're doing today? people. If you ask people in the world, why are you doing what you're doing today? What would their response be? Well, they would say, well, the, the, the government gives me power to do this. Does the government give you power to do that? That's a question. The, the media says it's okay. My religion tells me it's okay. Why does your religion tell you that it's okay? Based on what scripture verses or are you basing that on? It's like, uh, Larry, you and I were talking earlier about there are scriptures. But the problem is, people come along and twist the meaning of scripture. And then where are you left? We've got to pick up the Bible. We've got to read the Bible. And we have to get serious about what the Bible is really telling us. And if there's anything that I've noticed and you've noticed as well out there, is there is a lack of serious studying of God's Word, being students of the Word. To do what? To learn the truth, that the truth might set us free. For so many years, when I came to, under, to uh, you know, when I'd hear parables and uh, other Bible stories or the teachings of Christ, I was all mixed up on who is this about? Who does it apply to? What's the meaning and purpose of, of these parables? They just, they make no sense to me. I don't, I don't really understand the application. And so I, most of, for most of my life, I really did not care for the parables. What, Jesus, the, 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 uh, what Christ gave us. And, f- and we know that the Bible tells us, for the most part, he talked to people in parables. Why would he talk to people in parables? Was he trying to hide the truth? Well, the Bible kind of says that. The Bible says he was hiding truth from certain people. It's like uh, the folklore and all the stories about uh, Cinderella and uh, the uh, uh, Jack and the Beanstalk and all these other wonderful stories that we have that have been handed down to us. I now understand them, and it went, and I have new light on them. Do, do you not as well? That those were stories that they were used and and spoken and heard through among our race, among the Caucasian, Anglo-Saxon people, because they were being persecuted by a false church, by a false uh, Babylonian type of a government, we, w- we could say. There were these uh, oppressive regimes and oppressive re- uh, governments that existed, and Christians were had to, um, in many ways, conceal the identity and truth of who they were, their, their biblical identity. And so they continued, and they used these, fo- these uh, folk, wonderful folklore stories to preserve who we are. Just like, and it's the same way in which Jesus used the, these wonderful parables to that the truth of who we are, the identity of who Israel is, might continue from generation to to generation. But 
The key is, what is the truth? Is the truth really being exposed today? We're living in a, in a generation, do you not know this and understand it? I, that's a rhetorical question. That we're being lied to on so many levels. That's one of the biggest weapons of the enemy is promoting lies. And what's one of our biggest weapons then? Promoting the truth. Promoting the biblical truth. I want you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10 and verse 27, please. John chapter 10, verse 27. Because in what I was saying about going to these other nations, that would be considered heresy to to question whether that would be a sound, right thing to do or not. And they would say, for the most part, if you go to any church, in the, they would say, that's the right thing to do. That's what we should be doing. And I say, to call upon these pre-Adamites with a prodigal son application, as some would apply the prodigal son story, to come home, and that's what had to happen in the prodigal story. Come home to the, to the Father or come home to Christ and repent would be, I say, misguided message. And that's mostly what is happening today. We have heard a misguided message. So, we are wrongly guided in a direction that will lead to false conclusions and give us a false understanding of God's calling and purposes. We've got to come out of this misguided understanding. We've got to come out of these lies that we are being fed. You know... I heard the other day, and I may have said this already, but in Colorado, they've come up with, I don't know what it was exactly, 125 or 127, something like that, uh, definitions on gender. And that you can claim to be whatever you want. I don't know how they can come up with uh, three, four, or five definitions of gender, much less a hundred, over a hundred of them. Who are these people? Where did they come from? And yet we know if a lie, and it does, I don't care who said it, if a lie is repeated often enough and long enough, and we're not in the real truth, we're not in the biblical word of God truth, we can be deceived. And that doesn't mean just hearing one or two scripture verses. That means that means having a full Bible understanding. And you have to stay in the Word all of your life in order to get that and continue in that. I like David Barton. He says we've got to exercise that. Word. It's just like these uh, baseball teams. You know, every year they've got to go back to the basics and get that training down and get the basics down. We've got to do the same thing. And if, we're, if we are not trained in that, and we're not raised in the truth all the time. We don't stay in the truth all the time. We're going to be deceived by people come along throwing a couple of scripture verses at us that will sound right, but it's taken out, totally out of biblical context. John 10 verse 27 states who the subjects of Christ's redemptive purposes were. Quote, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. In other words, what does he tell? He's saying, my sheep are my covenant people. I'm, I established a covenant with them. We are, this. the Israel people are in a covenant with me. I didn't make a covenant with all the other races of the world. I'm not speaking against them. All I'm telling you is, let's get down to the brass tacks 
of what the Word of God is actually saying. Here's another example that I, or I love this verse. Romans 9, verse 4 states, Who are the Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption? Okay. Gosh, when I went to the Judeo Christian church, I, you many, many years ago, I heard all kinds of sermons about the adoption. And of course, they had this worldly definition of what adoption means. And I had no understanding of the migrations of Israel and how the ten tribes had become Gentilized and God gave them a written bill of divorcement and no understanding of what the mystery of the Gentile was. What mystery should there be? You know, Gentile means Gentile, right? I had no idea that there was a deeper understanding concerning God's people. So just on that alone, the adoption and then the glory. Oh, yes, we all hear about the glory. We're going to shout the glory of God. What does that mean? But who, who does this apply to? He said, who are the Israelites? These things apply to Israel. Would it be right and biblically okay for me to go and apply this to the pre adamite uh, races that exist? Would that give me the right results? Would that bring righteousness to the nation? Would that wake them would would they wake up and become Israelites in meaning and purpose and duty? And they would change the world because they've heard this good news here and they're applying it to themselves. They've been here I don't see any of that type of a change, do you? That in our, in our nation. I don't see it happening in the world. I don't see mis- we're misapplying whom the real people of God are and their duties and, and their rightful bi- duties, biblical duties and responsibilities, misapplying that will give us the right results. We've got to rightly divide the word of truth. We've got, to, we've got to be on the right biblical track, folks, or we're going to be lost. And are we not lost today as a people and as a nation? Are not the nations of end time regathered Israel lost today because they're not applying the right biblical light to their circumstances and conditions? And that's what I'm saying. We've got to get back to the right, uh, having a right understanding, the proper context of God's Word, we've got to get down to rightly applying that. And then it goes on to say in this verse, the glory and the covenants. Who are the covenants unto? Israel. And the service to God and the promises. Whose are the fathers? Of whom, as concerning the flesh... People on a spiritual light. As concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God bless forever. Amen. You see, the calling and purposes of God are specifically addressed throughout the pages of the Bible unto Israel. So if we have that right understanding, that, oh, okay, now I know whom these callings and promises and the purposes of God and the spiritual duties are, they are applied unto Israel. So maybe we should spend, we should concentrate our efforts to getting Israel to understand who they are and the right and do the services, proper services that are outlined in the Word of God for them to do, when we have real light coming forth, when we have real truth, when we have real change coming forth by doing this? And will we not have nothing but confusion if we misapply what the Word of God is telling us? Absolutely we will. And that's Really what it's all about, folks, right there. Let's get on the right biblical track.
The prodigal son parable is about the lost tribes of Israel being restored. And let me tell you something, folks. It's a wonderful story. If we rightly understand the Word of God, and we rightly apply what the Word of God is telling us, it'll change your outlook. The spiritual light will go on. And something's wrong today because the spiritual light has not gone on. Because what are we hearing today? What is this gospel that most people are hearing today? It's a Judeo-Christian gospel. Uh, let me just put it this way. It's a twisted um, form of a gospel in which uh, there's this corrupted truth that has been brought in by terrors. And we've got to get... Um, we've got to stand, as the Word of God says, as Christian soldiers. And the meaning of Christian soldiers and what our duties are and what our, responsibility, uh, our responsibilities are as Christian soldiers has been corrupted. Because that means... We're to be watchmen on the wall. And a watchman on the wall cannot be an effective, good watchman on the wall, dear friends, if he has a corrupted gospel that he's being led by. How do you think that's going to work? So we have to diligently uh, stand for the, on the truth. That means we have to read God's Word, be Bereans of God's Word, be led by the truth, and as we're led by the truth, the light will come on. And it'll change everything for us. If it's the proper faith, will awaken us as well. And it's faith in God, faith in His purposes, faith in the promises of God. Abraham had that type of faith. Do you have, dear friends, the faith, that type of faith in the promises of God? The faith of Father. Now, I have to inject in this because there's a marvelous message about the uh, Father Abraham and the faith of Father Abraham that we are being we were presented in the scriptures. And what was that faith that came upon Abraham, Father Abraham? What was dis what was that faith displaying? Well. It was displaying an awakening. A faith that awakened him. That same faith, guided type of faith. We need to have the right faith. We need to have the right substance. I want you to turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 30. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 30. We were reading these verses before. I'll go ahead and read the uh, verse before, verse 29. But if thou hence, but if from uh, thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. You'll find it if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul, dear friends. And by the way, that, that's an important word, friends. We're not hired servants. We're friends. We're a special, um, we're in a special place as Christian people. And we're to be light bearers. It's important that we understand that because we're not here to promote just any light. We're here to promote all the promises of God. We are here to promote the 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 reason for our faith. What is the reason for our faith? It's, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 30 says, When thou art in tribulation, and of course the prodigal 
uh, son that, in that story. He was in tribulation, was he not? And all these things are come upon thee even in the latter days. And I would say, yes, even in these latter days. This applies. It says, goes on to say, If thou turn unto the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, and he will not forsake thee. These are wonderful words here. Think about how these verses describe our God. It says that he is a merciful God. How many people think about God Almighty as being a merciful God? He is. That means that he, he loves us. He has a plan for us. He wants us back, to put it plain and simple. He wants uh, his people back. That's why he made a covenant with them. He wants to continue in this relationship, and he wants to bring it to a greater level. That's what the kingdom is all about, the kingdom of God. It says, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers. He won't forget the covenant of that he, covenants that he made with your fathers, Israel, which he swore unto them. You see, our people have forgotten the covenants. The covenants are not being taught today, are they? Very few places can you go in any of the churches in our land where the, the real covenant purpose, purposes of God are taught. And we need to uh, get back to that. You see, God Almighty is there for His prodigal children to welcome them back. Back to His covenant. His covenant is eternal. The covenant that God Almighty made with Abraham is eternal. It is still ongoing today because God gave His word. He didn't ask Abraham for His approval or agreement with that. God gave His word. It's an eternal Abrahamic uh, covenant that He gave to Abraham and his seed. And the day is coming, according to this wonderful parable that we're going to be getting to, that Israel is going to be restored. That day is coming. Take hope, my friend, in th my friends, in that. Truth will be awakened within Israel. The, the truth, as the scriptures say, and Jesus told us, is going to do what? It's going to set his, his people free. And the church... That's one of the main duties and responsibilities of the true biblical church of God is promote the truth of God's Word. There's a lot of so-called truths again that are out there. But they're not, those truths will not set you free. Those truths will not set America free. Can any of the truths, may I ask again, of the uh, wisdom and humanistic wisdoms and Institutes of man and philosophies of man set us free. Have, is that being done? Do you feel be, that you're being set free today, America? Or that you're being brought into bondage? And, and you're being fed corruption today? Do you feel like you're being corrupted? Well, that's why you are being corrupted, my dear friends. And... And because I don't and you don't want to be corrupted, we're going to do what? We're going to cling to the Word of God. We're going to believe the Bible. We're going to uphold Jesus Christ and His kingdom. We're going to live this truth. We're going to promote that truth. And that's the story that needs to be heard by the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Germanic, and kindred Israelite people today. They need to hear this truth, and they're not being told this truth. They're being corrupted again. Jeremiah, let's turn there. 
Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 16. Jeremiah 31, 16. Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again, speaking of Israel, and uh, they shall come again from the land of the enemy. You see, this, can you see the prodigal son story here? Prodigal son went off with his wealth, with his inheritance. He went and he got corrupted there. And what these verses are telling us here is that Israel's going to return to the Father, to their heavenly Father. Verse 17. And there is hope. Aren't, aren't those wonderful words? It says, there is hope. There is hope in thine end, saith the Lord that thy children shall come again to their own border, home again with the Father, restored with the God of Abraham or God of Israel. Verse 18, I have surely heard Ephraim, Ephraim is just another term for Israel, bemoaning him thus, thou hast chastened me. The prodigal children of Israel, this is what they're saying when God from what God has done unto them. Thou hast chastened me, and I was chastened as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. See, before Israel was unaccustomed. I like that word. Interesting. Una we were unaccustomed to the yoke. God says, I'm going to get make you accustomed to the yoke. I'm going to bring you um, into bondage. You're going to experience this yoke. And he says, in that you're going to turn unto me. Turn thou to me, uh, me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. He's, you know, I think of this as faith. This is faith when I'm reading verses like this. The Bible, Jesus tells us about the faith that can move a mountain. Faith that will turn the hearts of Israel. There's a mountain right there. Faith that will turn the hearts of Israel. This is what God Almighty and the purposes of, of what he's doing unto Israel is what, what his purpose, his divine purposes will show and demonstrate in the end when God's through with Israel. Do you see this? Oh, no, I don't see it. Well, you know why? Because you're in the process of this turning still, my dear friends. We're, we're, that story isn't, hasn't been completed yet. But God is going to complete that story. It's a wonderful story. Do you have faith in Him and His purposes? Verse 19, surely after I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, so he repented and, and he's given instructions, and I smote my thigh and I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach, reproach of my youth. He says, I was turned, I repented, and after that I was instructed. You see, that instruction, yeah, it's going on today with the remnant. But that instruction is going to go on in a greater way under and through the kingdom of God. Now, can you imagine, you, most of you and most of us heard some truth and we, and just, we could say even with this um, small amount of truth that we heard way back when, we repented and we turned. But the Word of God indicates here that there's going to be even greater teaching that we can look forward to. Light and truth. I mean, and then true liberty and freedom and liberty will be proclaimed throughout the land because they will, 
Israel will, will really awaken and come to understand what real, true, biblical freedom and liberty is all about. We haven't seen that yet. We've seen a part of it, but it's coming. And thus, we have the prodigal son story. What a day of rejoicing that will be when God's covenant people awaken and repent. It's like 2 Chronicles 7, 14. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You see, it's all about the Jacob Israel, the white Caucasian Saxon Jacob Israel people awakening. This is not a call to the world again. It's for his people to awaken, and various things are going to happen once this occurs. Right now, we're just like the Elijah ministry. We're out there doing this. We're taking on various things. We're awakened, and we go out though because and 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 the uh, the spirit of God speaks to us. I'm speeding up that story, and shows them that hey, there's seven thousand also out there that haven't bowed their knee to Bell, and you feel like you're all alone. Well, we're all alone. There's this remnant out there that haven't bowed their knee to Bell, but there's a greater number coming. There's a, there's a greater revelation to this prodigal son occurrence, what ha- has happened there, what's going to transpire. You see, the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God has to be written or come within us or live within us. Can you see that happening yet? Well, we could say in part, we see in part, we know in part, we understand in part. Yeah, we're, uh, all that. But there's a greater kingdom awareness and awakening coming with with a real kingdom resolve in our heart. I am resolved to follow the kingdom. Right? Leaving the world behind. Jesus, highest, greatest, All these words of that song come forward to me. And it's going to be the type of song that's going to be sung in Israel, I believe. That day is coming. Okay, let's go to Luke 15, the prodigal son story. Continue where we were uh, last week. Verse 16. Again, I think we're going to see the comparison in these words prodigal verses with what we just got through reading in uh, Deuteronomy and uh, Jeremiah. Verse 16. And he, the prodigal son, will frain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave, uh, and no man gave unto him. Because as last time, The prodigal son had gone, gotten his inheritance, and gone off into these other countries. And everything seemed to go okay for a while. But something happened. God caused a a famine. Or God caused a pestilence. God called for the... uh, the alien to come into our midst, to bring their false gods, to bring their culture. And we get to experience why that is bad, why what we've done. There's an awakening that comes into Israel. Oh my God, what have we done? Has the light gone off about that? You know, to a degree, seeing that today, are we not? We're seeing various nations and various, you know, uh, um, uh, in Europe, there are a number of nations, let's just say, that have awakened to this and their leaders are responding in the right way. And I say praise God for that. And we need to, and we're even seeing that with, you know, the appointment and the, uh, of, uh, um, and God appointed him. 
President Trump, are we not? I mean, there's some, there is an awakening of sorts that are happening all over. That Can't we see that? And what is one of the main things that our people, our Israel, white Caucasian people are upset about today? I can guarantee it. They say all the time, build that wall, build that wall. Everywhere Trump goes, build that wall. Who's saying that, Israel? Because there's an awakening of all these aliens coming into our nation and what they're doing to our nation. It's an affront to God Almighty. How can we call ourselves Christians and allow pagans to bring their religion in here? We're seeing it in commercials all the time, on TV, promoted in magazines, everywhere. It's being promoted, pagan ways, pagan lifestyle, p- p- pagan dress. Verse 17, speaking of the prodigal son. And when he came to himself, I like that. When he came to himself, meaning the light went off, he saw his depraved condition. Because he, the word was in him. Get this, folks? The word was implanted in him. And now that word of truth is awakening finally. He's seeing the light. Oh, my God. I see what's happening in our nation now. My Father, my Heavenly Father, that's really who, it was telling me all this. He was giving me understanding. And now I'm seeing the truth of these warnings from His Word. And there's repentance. And He said, He came to the place where He said, How many hired servants of my Father have bred enough and to spare he says and i'm perishing right now i'm hungry i will arise and go to the father hallelujah and i will say unto him father i have sinned against heaven and before thee and i am no more worthy to be called thy son make me as one of thy hard servants prodigal son He sinned against God like the prodigal children of Israel. They're no more worthy to be called his son. And this is why God Almighty, first of all, he had to write Israel a bill of divorcement. Can you see the correlation of the prodigal son and the children, prodigal children of Israel? And how God Almighty had to send them out. He cast them out, right? And sent them unto, let's say, the Gentiles. They became as the Gentiles. They became as the heathen. Now, in this story here, in this prodigal son story, he says... "Um." I want to go home, and I just want to live as one of the hard servants. They at least had bread, and they had more than enough for them. What? This is kind of interesting. You see, Israel had lost their place. They became as what? They became as of fathers, our Heavenly Father's hard servants. Do you get that in this story? They literally became as hard servants. They weren't true sons. They weren't true children of Israel anymore. And God Almighty, what's what's going on here? He knew this. That's why he sent them out to become as the heathen. And he would use divine circumstances and conditions to wake his people up. They would awaken to his word. You know, there's a quote for us to think about. It's by Tom Tenney. He said, Ironically, it was the father's blessings that actually financed the prodigal son. The prodigal son's trip from the father's uh, face. And it was the son's new revelation of his poverty, the poverty of his heart, that propelled him back into the father's arms. The prodigal son returned home. Why? Why? Verse 18 tells us. 
He said, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Prodigal Israel wasted their physical and their spiritual inheritance. You see, take Israel's wealth away from them. Take their wealth away from them, and what's going to happen? There's an awakening that's going to begin within them. Israel, you think, oh, it'd be wonderful to be like the other nations out there. Really? You really think that? Well, then I'm going to bring these pagan nations and pagan empires into, into your land, and you're going to get a mouthful of it. And you tell me if you like it. Well, I'm losing some of my, I'm losing my benefits. Our, our world is becoming sinful. I mean, all of a sudden now, what? We're, we're, gonna, we're supposed to embrace homosexuality and now transgenderism and all this corruption is coming into our land? They're building more pagan temples? I mean, all the time I'm hearing from people are, you know, living in California, they're living in Nevada, they're living in Texas. Oh, pastor, they're, they're built a pagan temple just down the road from me. A Muslim temple or whatever, or a Buddhist temple. Yeah. God's allowed that. He, he's rubbing Israel's face in their rebellion. And that's what it was in this prodigal son story against him. It has been said, wealth is wasted on the young. Because they don't have them to maturity, right? Wealth was wasted in a sense but with a divine wisdom, of divine cunning that God used to restore his Israel people. But here's the question concerning the prodigal son, concerning the prodigal children of Israel. And I'll be closing here. Were they raised righteously? God's children of Israel, were they raised righteously? My dear friends, well, they were God's children. What kind of a parent was he if he didn't give them the law? God gave him them his law. He raised them in a righteous way. How many parents today, you, I, and I've heard from them, Pastor, I, I, I raised we, my, my husband and I, or my wife and I, had raised our children in a godly home in a godly way. We read to them the Bible. We did the best we could as parents, and they turned out to be heathens. They turned out to be reprobates. What happened? Well, take heart, my friends. We could say, in a sense, the children of Israel were raised by God Almighty, and they turned out to be rebellious children. They're, they're, but there's hope in this prodigal son story that they're going to return unto the heavenly father. They're going to repent one day. God has a way of doing that. Well, I've been awake all these years, pastor, and I've been awake. What's going on? What's my kid thing? Hey, let me take you back 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. How were you? How did you behave? What mistakes did you make? Yeah, kind of brings in the Judge Kavanaugh's uh, hearing and all that junk that was going on there. I must conf confess, and most of you already know that, when I was young, I became very rebellious. And I was raised in a Christian home and a Christian family. They did their best for me. Oh yeah, they could have done a better job here and a better job there. But they kept their eye on me, and they said no a lot of times when I wanted a yes. And thank God they did, or I'd be in more trouble probably. But um, I, uh, I rebelled. I got to the height of my rebellion, and uh, I remember I ran away from home. I didn't stay in that condition. Uh, actually, uh, uh there was such a thing as hunger and clothes and uh, food and all these other things that uh, mounted up on me. And I said, gee, I was like the prodigal son. I had it much better in my home, so I'm going to go home. 
And I remember I was with my friends. They kind of laughed at me. Like, oh, you're joking. You're going to go home? Yeah, I'm going to go home. I'm sick of the stupidity with you idiots. I'm going home. And there was an awakening. You see, God Almighty has a purpose in this. So you, you, and again, a lot of you parents have said, I've done the righteous thing pretty much. I wasn't perfect, but I, I tried to raise him in a gutty home and do the gutty thing. And yeah, I understand that. And think about it. God Almighty, his own children rebelled against him and, and went the way of the world. Sometimes parents, you just have to let your, par your kids go the way of the world. You just have to let them go the way of the world and pray for them. Have faith in God that he will turn things around for his prodigal children of Israel. But that's what happened. We were talking about wealth earlier. The prodigal son, he was broke. And what happened basically because he was broke, he ran out of his inheritance Things got worse and worse, worse, and eventually the light went on. He says, I'm going back to the father. And the father said, he embraced his son and kissed him, and he welcomed him back home. Think about that picture. What a wonderful day of restoration that will be. A day of restoration is coming for Israel, my dear friends. Take hope in that. Have faith in the promises of God. <coughs> got to close? We'll end right there for now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do pray that truth will awaken within your people. We thank you for this prodigal son story. There are many wonderful things that we can learn from it and take to heart. And I believe that will give faith into your people. Just like Elijah, he was discouraged and ran off and you showed him, don't be discouraged. Uh, Elijah, there are 7,000 others who have been, uh, not bowed their knee to Baal. Have a different perspective, Elijah. And I'm telling, and your word is telling your prodigal people out there, you know, have faith, have hope. Some of you have turned, some of you repented, many of you have, but a lot have not. Let's give our brethren time. Let's give the Holy Spirit time to work his wonderful work within Israel.